Welcome back to the Invest in Yourself podcast. Today's show features Ronald Fino. In the past, for many years, Ron did some work for the FBI. His father was a mafia boss named Joseph Fino. Joseph Fino was a captain in the Buffalo crime family under longtime mob boss Stefano Magadino. Under the protection of his powerful father, Ronald joined the corrupt labor local 210, which was controlled by Stefano Magadino. Ron also would go on to infiltrate the Russian mafia. Ronald is now retired from his FBI services. Ron went on to write a book about his life. The name of his book is called Mr. Undercover. In his book, he goes into way more depth about his life story. Please subscribe to my channel for more interviews like this. And without further ado, let's get into Ronald's story. Hey, Ron, how you doing? Good, my friend. How you doing? Good, man. Thank you for coming on. I really Oh, you're like, welcome. <laughs> like I, I was telling you. Is, Bob's in the news these days. I, oh. I see so many wannabes, <laughs> or I hear from wannabes, and then I hear all these experts. They're so yeah. it's, you know, I was classified as an expert by the Bureau, and I had to go through a court voir dire, and this was in a, a, the, a Cleveland case. Of course, I never, I do not consider myself an expert. I don't believe there's such a thing. I can tell you, talking to high officials in the mob uh, through the years, some would diff say different things about the structures. And it's like even with the Genovese's in New York, they never really seemed to know if it was Chin Giganti, what part Tony Salerno played. And these are higher ups. You know, I knew Joe and Gallo, who was the consig for a while in, uh, in New York City with the Genovese family. And he didn't know. Sammy Pieri. Who uh, his nickname was Archie and mine was Reggie from the cartoon character I <laughs> ran with for, for quite a few years. And we went to Cleveland, uh, New York, New Jersey, but mostly with the Genovese's. Uh, I mean, Chicago, we were close to. I mean, very, the Buffalo family's always been close to Chicago. We've always had a good relationship. The same with Detroit. The Zerillis, who ran Detroit for so many years, were related to the. Uh, uh, Stefano Magadino and his, and his kid Tony. Now, I met Stefano when I was a child, but I was so young. I just remember being introduced to him by my mother. I think my father was in jail at the time because it was my mother and I had to like wait, wait in line to say, uh, you know, hello to the old man or give her, you know, kiss his hand, so to speak. Uh, <laughs> yeah. My mother was upset because he gave me only $5. But, you know, that. You know, I remember vaguely, but his son, uh, uh, I, I knew very, very well, this, right. uh, Stefano's son, you know, so we were close. Well, Ron, I you know, know. I got to know quite a few of them. Huh? Yeah, I was going to say, so what was your early life like, you know, growing up? Because like you said, you met Staff, Stefano Magadino, you yeah, know, yeah. when, it, so when did you uh, ultimately, you know, have these first mob encounters? Was he the first guy or, you know, how old were you? Well, no, what, what happened is, you know, and remember back in then, I didn't know any such thing about the mob. I just knew that I would call these men uncles. My father was in jail and uh, uh, other mobsters would bring, some mobsters would bring food or try to help us through the tough times because we were living on welfare. We had nobody to take care of us. And uh, ironically, it didn't come from my father's family. I would, was taken in by a, a band by the name of uh, Marshall Miles. He would take me for the summer. Marshall was the manager of Joe Lewis, the famous boxer. and But, of course, he also ran the numbers racket in <laughs> uh, Western New York. But he, it, it, I mean, he was cool. He was nice. He introduced me to my first steak. Uh, oh. But we were so poor. By, as you read in my book, my mother uh, would have to come and help me shovel snow to make a living. We had no money coming in for soup money. I, I, uh, at one time, we're shoveling this lady's, uh, this woman's uh, driveway and her walkway out. And I kept telling my mother, George, stay out in front. I didn't want the woman to see it. It was my mother uh, helping me shovel the snow because she wanted to come out. She felt sorry for me and my brother, or my brother and I, and uh, <laughs> I didn't want to see it. It was my mom. But we no. would do that. We would shovel snow. So I grew up hard. I, I grew up on the streets. I grew up with a lot of people where you had to earn your respect by either being stronger or strong enough or at least tolerating uh, you know them because life, you have bullies. And if you don't fight back, that bully is going to continue to do the bullying. And I learned to fight back early on. 
I was a tough kid. Not yeah, criminally. I now, I, don't get me wrong. I did some crimes. I remember two occasions. One where I stole a Christmas tree. And I got caught. I think it was around seven or eight years old. And I got caught because I was taking it over fences to get it home. <laughs> and, of course, I'm, tra I'm dragging it as well. So the, <laughs> where I stole it from, they followed me to my house because of the trail and came in. We want our tree back. <laughs> Another time, I broke into a toy store. Now, no one could figure it out, but I figured out how to get in there. But what I did is I didn't take anything. I didn't want to. It was more the accomplishment of being able to break in. And I, I was, again, about nine years old. I was just, a, 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 you know, I started early. And, but my mistake was telling others how I got in. Because then I heard, I read, or someone told me that the toy store was broken into, and a lot was missing. <laughs> oh <laughs> man! <laughs> Those are the two occasions that are the most prominent in my yeah. life. I mean, I ran with tough kids, but we loved each other. You know, it didn't, it didn't matter what color you were or religion you were, or your nationality. We all respected each other. It was a little different back then. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, your dad, he was in prison all this time, you know, from, from when you were zero, <laughs> since you were a newborn to you're eight years old. <laughs> yeah, well, it's a little, yeah. I remember he came back in the 50s. Uh, okay. And we didn't have a, my mother didn't drive. I mean, we lived off my, my mother, who was German, German, Irish, Dutch, Scotch, and a few others. Her father gave us a place to live. Their last name was Burkhardt real German and he was I used to click my heels together and give the, the Nazi salute to him when I was a kid and they'd be chasing me down the street. <laughs> Get over here you little bastard. Oh you my know, God. So, uh, but you know it was good man. It's tough. He was tough and my mother would tell me stories about him. My mother became more like my sister. Uh, uh, and one of the things she really promoted with me is reading. I read books since I was as far back as I could remember. I've been reading books. It started out with Classics Illustrated. They were a type of uh, comic book, but it wasn't a comic. It was more, uh, you know, they'll show the pictures of, uh, you know, Rob Roy or Les Miserables, whatever book you read, uh, The uh, Classic Chief by Nikolai Gogol. I mean, it would show the pictures, but that led me into reading the regular book. <laughs> which uh, yeah, I yeah. did. I was a regular at the, at the library. And that was one of my, uh, I, I think, helped me to become better educated and, and focused on other areas. Right. Yeah, but eventually, you know, yeah, when my, skills. yeah, when I, my father came home, we would go on Saturdays to make the, what was called the rounds. We would have breakfast at this one restaurant. A lot of mobsters would be there. And from there, we would go to the bookmaking uh, uh, halls or uh, uh, rented apartments, things of like that. And you would have to go in, and there's guys walking around in their shorts, taking the book. And then, and, and we had flash paper, which would go up in an instant of the place was uh, or, you know busted. But a lot yeah. of my father's uncles, or my uncles rather, his associates, that's what they did. My father was a bookmaker. Him and my uncle Nick, who was also made. That were the only two from the Fino family that were made. Oh, like, so, <clears throat> I was going to say, so when he came out, that's what he started. You know, he was a bookie. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. He, he was a bookmaker, but we get to see the various people and we'd mm -hmm. go around. I, I know Uncle Freddie Rondaccio very well. We'd see him and his wife, Celia, or Johnny Camilleri, who was my godfather, who was killed. He was killed. Uh, later on in the, the 70s because there was a dispute in the family after my father had stepped down as a boss and they wanted the Bananos to come in, my father's side. And that's why Jenny Camilleri was killed. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of people don't know that. And he was a made member at one point? Oh, yeah. He, 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 I had my problems with Johnny. When I eventually went into the union, he, wanted to, he thought he had a lot to do with winning my election, which is not, not true. He may have had a lot to do with them being, you know, keeping them, uh, the, uh, the mafias separated. He worked on that with other members of the family that were associated with my father, and, uh, Johnny Camilleri, Danny Sanzanese, uh, were on one side, and you had the Tadaros and the Pieris on the other, and the Rendaccios. Uh, 
uh, it, it, was, it was a tough, uh, you know, tough mess. And, and Vic, actually, it was Vic Rendaccio that brought me into the union. He, uh, my father was the acting boss at the time. This was after the Magadino takedown for the half a million dollars in cash, the family takeover. What my father didn't know is that he was put up as the head in case there was a hit. They wanted mm -hmm. that, that you know, the people behind him. But at first they were successful and they took over the family. And my father was uh, the acting boss for a, oh, a couple of years anyway. Uh, all, now when I was at work, I worked regular construction at that time. I was working in the field. In fact, I worked in the steel mills and I probably have asbestosis for all I know from it. I did, we did a lot of uh, asbestos removal. I, I worked on roads. I learned how to do survey work. And I worked with the superintendent laying out roads, how, you know, how much you should dig, how, you know, where it's going to be. If you have to undercut, you can go on and on what it takes. Uh, but then at Cape time, uh, Vic Rendaccio wanted to have a, uh, bring someone in. And he had a choice between Danny Sanzanese Jr. and me. And Vic later told me I wanted to go with the smart one. I mean, he, not that I consider myself smart, but he chose me. The hand. Uh, and, but when I went with the union, I couldn't do anything. I was uh, appointed as a business agent, and I was given a designated area, but I was not to do anything except take rides to see that everything's okay, but not to interfere with the union stewards, don't, don't get involved in the actual union business. Well, this I couldn't do. I would, have, I would hear grievances from uh, Native Americans. I hear grievances from a lot of different groups. Why aren't we doing this? Why aren't we doing that? Why am I getting screwed? Why am I uh, being cut off when, I, when other people are brought in here? And, you know, you want to answer. You, I just can't say, well, I can't answer for that. I felt, you know, it, it really bothered me quite a lot. I want to imagine. I asked the business manager at that time, Sam Bongiovanni, even though it was Vic Rendaccio that ran the union. He was the secretary treasurer. They said, no, you can't. Well, that eventually led to a breakup of me and causing my, my father heartache and all of them because I left. Uh, I had my own side, too. I had uh, South Buffalo Irish. I had all these different various groups, Afro-Americans, Native Americans behind me. And we, we you, know, you know what I felt we could win. My father told me, you're never going to win. You're going to get yourself effing killed. No, you don't know this life like I do. You're going to get killed. I said, well, if it want to take me on, I'm going to make a lot of noise about it. But he did that. As he said, he needed allies. And he, he brought on Camilleri and uh, Danny Sanzanese, a few others. Uh, Roy Carlisi was on the other side. Roy, uh, his brother, Sammy Wings, took over Chicago. Roy came from Chicago. And... We went through the whole process. Sammy Frenchamori, who was the spokesman for the other side, he's the, the, he was the became boss of the Buffalo family, and he was the uncle of Joe Tenaro. Uh, Joe Tenaro, were both you know the, the senior and junior, he, uh, there was they were tied at the hip, and he says, "All right, Ronnie." He went and spoke to me. We're going to let you run, but you're going to keep it clean. You're going to keep it clean. We don't want no more of this media stuff in there because I was using the media. Uh, you know, we don't want any more of that. Just keep it clean. And eventually the election came by. Now, I had to take on Danny Sanzanese Jr., which I did not want to do. I did not want because this guy was nothing but trouble. Be but because my father says, we need Danny Sanzanese. And then we had to bring out a lot of the money people so that we could finance a lot, it, even though I had to pay it back. Uh, so we had the election, and we won over two to one. I mean, it was a, a complete wipeout. Wow. Um, they never expected. They thought they were that like that we totally won the election. Damn. And just like that, you took over. Yeah. And that's when the problems began. Because within weeks, I was sat down by Roy Curley. See, we had a sit down. Uh, Sammy French Maury. Uh, I don't recall. Of, uh, uh, Sammy Perry wouldn't have been there, but his brother Joe possibly was. I, don't, I remember Nicky Ronaldo was representing Danny Sanzanese who was uh, in jail at the time. But I, I get set down and they said, and it was Roy doing his, most of the speaking after Sammy Frenchmore. He says, from now on, you're going to have to listen to us, Ronnie. It's our control. It's our union, not yours. 
you're not going to be allowed to do anything just because you won this election doesn't mean you're going to have the freedom you think you're going to have. Things are going to remain the same. And he was tough. Boy, he was a tough son of a bitch. And you better listen to me. And he pointed, and you know, they just, you better listen to me. So help you God, Ronnie. You know, your father was not even, but he wasn't even allowed into the meeting, my father, at this time. Damn. And, so he uh, wasn't the acting boss anymore at that point? No, no, he was out, yeah. Yeah, but the oh. election was over. With, so uh, Sammy Frenchmore became the acting then permanent boss. He was, uh, so they were tied to the Gambino. It's unlike my father who wanted the Bananos, but he was also tied to a, a lot of the Genovese's. But because of Perry, uh, Panaro's clout, I mean, excuse me, Sammy Perry's clout with the Genovese's, the Genovese's were going for uh, the other side. And so my father only had, from other families anyway, Ch Chicago stayed out, Detroit stayed out. Uh, so fact, when you're, oh, hmm? go ahead. No, go ahead. I was gonna say, so when your father, they, they who, who approached him, you know, to become the acting boss, or did he just kind of claim that position and then eventually oh, no, stepped no, down? Decided. You had Roy Carlisi, you mm -hmm. had uh, Danny Sansonese, you had quite a few of them. Freddie Brindaccio was in jail at this time. He was the underboss, uh, so he didn't have any say-so in it. But uh, a good majority of the Buffalo family, the Spanos, I mean, I could go on and on, supported my father. Babe Bellateri, you know, many names, you wouldn't mean anything to them at this stage anyway. But that they supported my father. And that's how he became the acting boss. He was put up there. They had certain rules. Sammy Frenchmore had supported my father. They all did. But no sooner was my father in there. And then, you know, gradually things started changing. And I'll never forget one time, I had, uh, once we had the union set up, I had to take a ride out to see the farmer, that Sammy Frenchmore. And my father went with me. And I was told that that meaning I have to let this Ralph Pelosi go. Uh, uh, let's see who else. My cousin Mike Burke, who was a business agent, I had to let uh, him go. I had uh, Jackie Giancarlo, who was, helped me a lot with the election. He had to go. They didn't want him. They're gonna, they were going to bring in the Pieris, uh, uh, Johnny and Joey Pieri, and uh, uh, Joe Tenero Jr. They were going to be appointed. So that created a, a, a nightmare for me because none of them ever worked. They never did their job as a business agent. They never visited their jobs. In fact, later on, uh, when uh, we had a dispute, when the split took place between the Pieris and the Tenaros, and there was a lot of, you know, it, it was becoming pretty nasty. Uh, what uh, was going on? Did a lot know, of people they, get they did Because they didn't like each other. Uh, Tony, in fact, I had, my name came to the attention of the commission, which I'll tell you in a second, from uh, Joe Pieri, the father of uh, Johnny and Joey Pieri. Uh, they were they came out of Youngstown, Ohio, because of the, the wars going on. They wanted to get them out of there. You know, we were having some... Uh, you know, the Cleveland Wars, things like that. So they wanted to get them out of that area. And so they came to Buffalo. And next thing you know, I'm pointing them as business agents. Well, they don't know anything about the labor. You did see, you know, all the contracts that, that had to be signed. I had to look at, you know, draft and do the work. Uh, not that I mind doing that. I enjoyed writing contracts and negotiations. But then I had to put up and tolerate all this, this back. These people that just don't care about themselves don't care about the working class. That was a problem. Yeah, and I would imagine. Th that, that eventually we had, I had to split up uh, the territories in Western New York to different, one to Joe Pieri, one to John Pieri, Dan Domino, who I liked immensely, he knew how to work. He ended up with an area. Sammy Cacci, that's Charlie Cacci's, uh, Bobby Milano's brother, and Jimmy Cacci. We sent him upstairs to the benefit fund. So he became the head of that for a while. Uh, then Danny Sanzanese ended up with part of it. Vic Rendaccio actually ended up. We had brought him back. That's a good story because I was having such problems with Danny Sanzanese uh, before I get to the areas. Uh, we're having such problems with him. I decided a plan. I met with this Joel Blue Eyes, Joel Latempio, the nephew of uh, Freddie Rendaccio. I says, Joey, I says, listen, let's bring Vic back. Let me see what I owe. They're never going to approve it. I said, maybe I can get it approved. I go and 
I meet Sammy Frenchamore at a Howard Johnson's. We used to meet halfway. And in there, I says, Sammy, I'd like to bring Vic back. Oh, stay out of this stuff. You're, please, please, please stay out of this stuff. All right. So I was told to back off. Well, about a week or two after that, Sammy Frenchmore contacts me and says, let's meet. He says, what if we approve this? How are you going to go about it? I says, it's simple. We have him nominated to take the position and Danny sends and he's going to have to step down as secretary treasurer, you know, that which, which was a prominent position, and let uh, Victor take it over. He says, here's what you do. You sit back. I'm going to be calling him. We didn't ever refer to it as a sit down, but a sit down. And I had to go out to this restaurant that was closed. Now we're out in the north side part of town. And the whole family was there. My father had to stay in the other room because he was not part of the uh, the crew, so to speak, that's going to be overseeing things. But they were all there. And Sammy Frenchmore was talking about this. He said, now, how are you going to do this? I said that you're going to have to get the Danny Sansonese to step down. And then, you know, we'll take care. We'll nominate Vic. He says, well, here's what you do. Tomorrow, you tell Danny Sansonese we want to meet at the same place at the same time. This was... Going toward the town of Wanda's, this restaurant. So I tell Danny Sansonese, we, we've been called to a meeting. And he's asked me, what's it about? I says, I don't know, Dad. But, you know, they wanted me to bring him. So we go in there. And they sat Danny Sansonese down. And along with me at the table. And uh, they told him. I, I, I don't know if it was Joe Pieri. I can't recall which one did the actual talking. But that he's going to have to st step down as the secretary treasurer, you know, I was going to appoint him as a business agent so that he you know, could have his pay and, and continue to work. And he yells out, but I'm my father. In other words, if his father was here, and who the hell are you? They tore in. Don't you ever talk to us this way. Don't you ever, ever. Now you're going to do it in period. We're telling you now. Uh, and uh, he says, okay, could I be the one that nominates Vic Rendaccio. He says, yeah, go ahead. You can nominate. Who cares who nominates him? You know, he's what, what's face saving for him? You know, he's looking like he's saving face. And so we brought Vic in. And Vic and I, became, Vic Rendaccio, Vic and I, because of bad, as enemies as we were, we became the best of friends. And I like Vic. And, and uh, uh, but then we started having the complications with the Pieris and the Tadaros. And Vic says, Roddy, I got my time and I'm going to leave. And I says, ah, Vic, it's up to you, Uncle Vic. I call, he's called him Uncle Vic. And, you know, it's up to you. I don't blame you, though. I, I, I'm thinking of getting out here. No, no, you got to stay. You got to stay. So uh, then after that, I had to split. I was getting back to splitting up the territories into the, for different people. Uh, so that, that took place. Well, the Pieris took in the southern tier, which takes in the Seneca Nations of Indians. Now, I've worked hard with the Seneca Nations. I always had a good relationship. And when we had the jobs that took place on the reservation, we always let the uh, American Indians, uh, you know, take, or as we refer to them today, Native Americans, uh, uh, you know, take over those jobs. Well, the Pieris went down and refused to do that because it was their new territory, and they appointed their own people. I got a call from Kelvin Lay, who was the president of the Seneca Nations, and a dear friend. I says, Kelvin, meet me in Eden, New York, at a certain place. Let's talk. So I tell him what's happening. I says, my recommendation is to you, for you, is to go to the Union Hall and go, go, go at least five to ten strong and demand that you find out who's taking care of, who, who caused this problem. And I says, I know it's the Pieris, but please don't mention their name because then it's going to lead back. And, uh, well, they went to the Union Hall. Not only did they go, they had one car where the top was cut off. They made it into a convertible. It was a hard top made into a convertible. And they went down there, two or three cars strong, and they're demanding to see the Pieris. They want to see the Pieris. Well, the Pieris were so scared that they stayed in the building all night long. Jeez. Later on, I'm, I'm down in Florida with uh, Joe Tadaro Sr. We're going to dinner. And, and Louis Giardina from New York, he was a, a cousin of his. He was also a Gambino uh, 
made member of the Gambino family. He's with us. And as we're going in, Joe says, can I talk to you a second? I said, yeah. He said, did you sick the Indians and the Pieris? And I said, yeah, I did. Oh, you caused me a problem. But don't worry, I'll take care of it. Did you sick the Indians? <laughs> yeah. So their father had gone to Tony Salerno and complained that I took the Tenaro side by doing this and, 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 and put the uh, American Indians on, onto them, you know, and his family. Jeez. Yeah, did, so I'm I, sure that caused a lot, whole well, lot of ruckus. And then it came up in the commission case somewhere. Uh, yeah. You know, I, knew, I knew some of them that I, uh, the commission came. Uh, 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 Ralph Scopo was a friend of mine. You know, I knew Ralph. Uh, it was with the concrete workers in New York City. I mean, a lot. Yes, but I know, you know, I know a lot of New York City. But anyway, right. that's how it started. And, and, so then and, you're going to go into like your undercover work, you know, when they. Oh, I started you. that earlier. No, no, I started that oh, early. early. Okay. So, yeah, so no. when did you get approached for that? Well, it was actually back in the late 60s. Wow. I got approached by a friend of mine uh, for, that I went to high school with. He says his uncle would like to talk to me and uh, to see if I could help them. And uh, so I eventually met with the. Uh, Philip Stone, uh, and also uh, Al Hartle, Alphonse Hartle, who uh, eventually went to work for the Labor Department, but was a former old OSS officer that worked with Abraham Harriman during World War II and then went on with the CIA. And him and I became close friends, Al Hartle. In fact, his family's on my Facebook now. <laughs> Al was uh, one of my mentors. And that was CIA. Uh, they had lost a lot of documentation out of a satellite office they had out in Clarence, New York. And one of the people that was involved, I happen to know, uh, he was, but he was with the SDS Student Association. And I talked to him on the side. I says, I don't understand. I says, I have to talk with you. And, but he was so bugged out or drugged up. I mean, it was bizarre by trying to talk to him. I couldn't get anything. He says, no, this. he's running from everybody. He's being watched. He probably was, you know, but, <laughs> you know, but he was so spaced out that he didn't know what was up or down. And I told him, I mean, there's no way this guy's going to, I don't know if it's mental or it's just a combination of everything, but there's just a way I could get in and open up. He kept switching the subjects. He refused to talk. And I knew the guy well, but that was my first experience. Right. And, and I, I uh, that from them, from there, I went with the, it started, I was playing tennis. I, I can't recall the year. It was about, I was in the, I was a business agent at the time, probably uh, 71, 72. I'm playing tennis and this big tall guy and the other starts to play. And, you know, we're just picking up a match. He goes, Ron, so I'm Ron. I'm Ron Hettinger from the FBA. And now I'm the one that's critical. I says, you know, you guys should be ashamed of yourself. You know the problems I'm going through. You know what I, I have to face. He goes to me, Ron, if someone like you could help us, we'll do something. I says, I'll help. But don't ever ask me to testify against my father or anybody in my family that I will not do. And they always honored that request because hmm. I wouldn't do that. I wasn't going to provide information outside of just the, the generalities of what my right. father my uncle would fall, but that, you know, otherwise I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't cooperate. And that's how it started. And I did that for, from that period up until about 1988. Dang. So and, 30 and, plus years. Yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, eventually was surfaced. I know who, I don't want to get into the name who surfaced me, but the Bureau agreed with me because my name leaked out that I was cooperating. That sent me on the, you know, the road to, I talked to Danny Domino, who uh, was an enforcer for Sammy Peary. By this time, Danny Domino and I were still close. And he says, Roddy, because they, they even had a hip fired from the union. And he was the one worker I had. He said, uh, Roddy, I want to find out what's going on. Uh, go to the certain restaurant downtown, and I'll have my brother-in-law go to see you. His brother-in-law goes to see me that evening and says, get out of town. There's a price tag on your head. And that's what I left. But the Bureau took care of me. They, they took me right in. And that's when I started working under a personal services agreement. That's how he worked as a contract employee. You know, there's no crime, so I don't have to 
worry about anything like that. I've never asked for uh, any help on anything. I because I didn't. I mean, I kept a simple life. Yeah, you know, broke life. <laughs> you know, but, uh, but simple. You know, so I was fortunate. So what, I was going to say. So what? You know, in the book, I know you said why, but I, you know, just for interview purposes, you know, why did you want to go with the FBI? And I, you know, I what they were doing to the union. I mean, I hated it so. It's like one time I had this Polish immigrant worker. I go into the union hall, and he's down on his hands and knees. Please, Ronnie, please, I need a job. I says, yeah, well, let's see what they. No, no, I need a job. No, I can't even buy a dress for my daughter's graduation. There. No, by heart, by heart, I hear that stuff. You know, my, my heart goes pounding. I go into the union hall and I ask the secretary, what job slips do we have? Well, this one's for Joe Tadaro, this one's for Danny Sanzanis. I said, give me one of the slips. I take it out, I give it to the worker. Later that afternoon, uh, they came in. I don't know, there was a couple of them. Uh, I don't know, one may have been Sammy Cardinelli, uh, but Victor, uh, Victor Sanzanis was there, Danny Sanzanis. Uh, Joe Tadaro never yelled at me or anything like that. He it was more, you know, he, he actually, he stood up at my wedding, Joey Jr., uh, we call him Joey Pizza. So when you hear that, that's we call JT the senior, you know, and then Joey Pizza. We didn't use Big Joe uh, because we didn't consider him that at that time. That was after his father died. But anyway, they they, they tell me, who the fuck do you think you are given that slip? This this goes to people of our, that, are, that are close to us and our family. You can't give it to these. I says, wait a second now. I says, you know, it's their union. He says it's not their union, it's our union. Whoever was the spokesman, you know, I think that it's our union. So that's what I dealt with. And I could take it so much. And then there came a time in 1988. Now, they they still wanted me to stay at because they knew the Teamsters wanted me. When I was in Cleveland and uh, with uh, Macy Rockman, the uncle of Jackie Presser, and, uh, and Jack Lacavelli, who I happened to get along with well, he would send me wine every year. You know, Presser was off this wall. He didn't know what was up or down. He didn't have a clue about union activity or what to do. And I went to dinner with Macy Rock, but his uncle, it was Presser's uncle, uh, and uh, Jack Licavelli, uh, Carmen from someone from the Electricians Union, and eventually Tony Libertori from the Labors, and Chester's brother caught up with us. But uh, the, now the wars were going on at this time. We had the Cleveland battle going on with the Irishman, and, but it was actually not the, the, the Irishman. He, he just was aligned with uh, the part of the family that were taken on the rule of Jack Lacavelli and uh, uh, Blackie Lacavelli uh, and Leo Mosseri. I went to the hospital to see Leo. He was killed eventually in that situation. Leo with lips. Uh, and what was that Cleveland war that was going on? Was it the, with the mafia and the Irish people? Yeah, well, that the, it wasn't the Irish people. I mean, you had the Irish, but I can't recall his name offhand involved. But he mm. it was more of a, a, a split in the coast of Nostra. Mm. And uh, there were uh, members of the, that, uh, I can't think of the names offhand, because I, I never dealt with them. You know, I didn't know the Irish enemies, you know, the other people from the, uh, the uh, but I did know Jack Lucavelli, Leo, quite a few of them, you know, from the Cleveland area. And we had oh, our okay. bodyguards, even when we went to dinner, we had the bodyguards with us. And, and that's where I found out about a leak, you know, in the Cleveland office. I always thought it was an FBI agent. When Tony Libertori told me that they had someone inside the uh, the, the bureau office, I reported it back. Uh, but I always assumed, uh, I never knew it was a secretary. I always, because they never told me who it was, but they were getting a lot of info. And uh, now I became concerned because if they, they have access to bureau records elsewhere, they're going to come up with my name. And that's why I reported it back. Uh, I mean, what's the name? Was a buffoon? Uh, uh, oh, what the his name? That was testified from Cleveland. Uh, the weasel, Jimmy the Weasel Fradiano. He was a nobody. They couldn't stand him. He, they called him the bug. He was all over the map. He had gone out to Los Angeles. He had gone all over. But with the blessing provided, because he did earn money, and he would kick back to the family. But personally, they didn't like him uh, very much. He, they were worried about him. He was uh, too much. Of, he tries to impress him, you know, people by being that he's bigger than what he was. 
the, 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 you know, Cleveland and I became quite close. Now, they wanted to make me move up in the Teamsters Union. Lacavelli offered me a position. You could move up to be right under pressure. Well, I brought that offer back to Joe Tenaro Sr., and he said that, no, you can't do that. You're, you're needed over here. They wouldn't let me go. It would have been good for me. I, You know, I met Hoffa's kid. I didn't know Hoffa. Uh, I don't even get involved in the Hoffa homicide outside of, you know, uh, what Dan Moldea has written. Danny, I think Moldea, if I had to talk to anybody that knew about the Hoffa situation, it's Danny. Yeah, he covered yeah, a lot. He's been all his life. Uh, yeah, in fact, Roland McMaster tried to befriend me. They were using them, uh, beam me up, Scotty, uh, at the airport groups. Uh, what was the name of them? I can't recall their name. Lyndon LaRouche Group. Lyndon LaRouche eventually wanted me to run for his vice presidency. I met him in, in Pontiac, Michigan, or in, well, it's outside of Michigan somewhere at the home of his and his wife, Helgas. And he talked and he had this outline for how we could straighten out America. And I'd love to have you as my vice president. You know, and I, thought, I don't know about that. I, you know. <laughs> but that was Lyndon yeah. LaRouche, so I knew him too. You know? yeah. So you met lots of people, you know, I, I, I wanted to, you know, talk about a few of them, you know, like uh, you had me, I think one of the, one of the guys you met was uh, O'Neill De La Cro Croce, or how do you say it? O'Neill, not O'Neill, Neil, the, the, yeah, no, I knew him. The Neil. Gambino underboss, yeah. what was your interaction with him? I liked, yeah, I liked him, I liked Joe Piney, I mean, there was a number of them I liked, now, I wasn't as familiar overall with the Gambinos as I was, was, you know, was with the, the Genovese's and the Columbo's. And a small amount with the Lucases. I knew Paulie Vario and the Varios quite well. You know, on Long Island, Local 66, Mike LaBarbera, young Petey Vario. I, I knew them quite well. And they were named Peter and Paul. I don't know about Marie, but like they had in the movie. Uh, but, uh, you know, they, you know the, but they never would have associated that much with Henry Hill. It just mm -hmm. doesn't work that way. You know. I, what I, about... I, uh... Oh, with with the whole movie and everything, you know, so that you know that was portrayed. You know, they, they just kind of yeah, yeah, it was great. great. <laughs> I like that. I mean, De Niro and I, as you know, are friends. Yeah, damn. And he he, he uh, gets in his parts by talking to people such as me about how this person acted, things like that, the mannerisms, what to look for. Now, I didn't know. Um, I didn't know Henry Hill. I mean, I. That's someone I didn't know. I knew the people around. I didn't know Jimmy Burke either, but I knew the uh, the Cosa Nostra members, you know, uh, especially Paulie, Big Paulie. I know real well. And that's who I would work with. Paulie and his and his kid was set up a training fund. Petey, we had to help set a fund up for him on a local sixty six, and then I went to communicate with Mike LaBarbera, who was their go between as well. So I think that there were a lot. It's like I dealt with the Mason tenders, which was one of the big cases that I was involved in. The Gaspar Lupo uh, and how they operated the Mason tenders. Eventually, his son Frankie cooperated. To what degree, I don't know. You know, I, I did, he disappeared. They put him in the witness protection program or, or someplace. You know, some don't disappear. Like Frank Galata, he held he holds his head out there. Henry Hill did too, trying to make a buck. Yeah. And at the end, what a, I was going to say, what about your interaction with Joe Colombo? Because you met him, too. Yeah, Joe Colombo was to our house. He spent at our house. Uh, uh, him and uh, Scarpa came to our house to sit with my father. That was the early days when they were putting the Italian uh, Defamation League together. So we had a meeting in our house, and they say hello, you know. And uh, later on, I mean, we would have those when my father was the boss. Uh, they, normally, they were more careful, but our house was in a no man's land. It was Seneca at that time. So they could come in one or two or something. Not a big, you don't want to have a big show like you did at Appalachia. You know, then you could have problems. But no, they came to our house. And uh, we also, Frankie Valenti was also a go-between with Joe Colombo. He was out of Rochester. Uh, Reading Pecoretta. In fact, his son, Lauren, who became the boss, and I grew up together. We were, I, I liked Lauren. And <laughs> they had to fight with Buffalo. You know, the, the, and his father, dad, Rini. I mean, these are killers, but sometimes because one acts much more human than the other, <laughs> you get along yeah. with it. And Lauren and I, it's children. We used to play skipping rocks on the, you know, as children. So, <laughs> that so your dad would have, 
I was going to say, so your dad would have all these meetings with these guys. You know, I think, you know, even Joey Gallo came and right. Is that we? Uh, Joey Gallo. No, 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 no. I didn't know Joe. Tommy yeah, Gambino I, and Tony. No, no, I, didn't, I didn't know Tommy. I never met Tommy Gambino. Uh, None of them. No, I bet a lot of, don't get me wrong, but uh, Joe and Gallo, I mean, it was a good sig for a long time. I knew quite well uh, from the right. Gambino family, Joe Piney, uh, you know, Neil. Uh, Pelosa, you know, there was a couple. I mean, I, others, you know, kid, like the Louis, Louis Giardina, Larry Giardina were made guys. Uh, I dealt with them. They were out of local 23. I mean, there's a lot of others, just that I never associated a lot of with different families. Uh, you know, Ralph and I would meet Scopo and I quite a lot. In fact, there's photographs of us together and a few discussing problems, things of that nature. So, but I knew not, no, mostly Genovese's, though. I knew quite a lot of Genovese. Yeah, and and, and Colombo, and Colombo, there was quite a few. There was a really uh, apparently DiPietro. I forget what family he was with. He got killed, but we would get together. My father was close to the Colombos because of that Italian American defamation. So we were in touch with them all the time. The ones I personally, outside of the home meetings with them, uh, Ralph Scopo, of course, you know. But then uh, uh, th there were others. But mostly Genovese. Then Johnny Riggy, of course, and I were quite close. You what know, was your relationship with him? John Riggy? Well, they were yeah. both, uh, they were pushing the dental plan that Cleveland took and Local 210, my local, had to take, and they were pushing it on Riggy with this Dr. Jesse Hyman. Little did they know, I'm cooperating and explaining the kickback scheme. One time mm -hmm. I even got a $5,000 kickback, and uh, it was supposed to be for my father and I. Uh, this was our end from the dental plan. I go to Al Hartle. I says, you better arrange. I can't take this. I first of all told my father about it. I said, Dad, we don't want, no, no, get rid of it. We don't want, my father agreed with me. Don't take it. I, uh, but I couldn't give it back to him without the flags going up who I was. So I met with uh, the strike force, Al Hartle and Bob Stewart, and then I transferred the money over to them. I gave them the cash because I, I couldn't hold on to it. To him. So you, basically what you were doing with them, you know, you would just give them any information, any schemes or any bad things that were going on with the FBI. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it wasn't just uh, Buffalo, though, because I was so involved in New Jersey, New York, Cleveland, uh, Santo yeah. Tropicante down in Florida. You know, I knew Santo. Uh, what and, was and that? Was the West Coast, but it wasn't really the mob right in the West Coast as much as they were from different families in the east there, you know as, as long as i remember there was no such thing as a los angeles mob it, i mean yes certain people would head that area up but it was they came from different families a lot of that's why you had a lot of buffalo people out there chicago people you had quite a few you know i don't know if i knew spalatro or not i uh when i was at vegas i may have met him he would have been a gentleman with me though if i did meet him but i just don't recall now i did come up with his name in one of my old reports but you know i spelled his name wrong even in my old reports so that shows you how little i probably knew the guy yeah yeah so, and as far as uh, you know it's like frank culotta and all that i mean they're friends of mine you know frank's in my they're making we did a film together that still they're working on getting ready to publish it and we we did it at the same house that uh, De Niro and, and the team uh, used uh, for, for a casino for him and his wife. You know, we, we filmed at that place, the location. I happen to know the owner of that home quite well. And she's a, they're a wonderful couple. So they allowed mm -hmm. us to use their home. And Frank Collada came over. By this time, he's starting to go. He was on the, the breathing apparatus. And, uh, no, I knew Frank for, you know, a lot of years after he had turned. You know, because by this time, you know, after he went in the witness protection program, I knew him. But I didn't recall knowing him from Chicago or Vegas. I don't recall. Just after that. the fact? Yeah, yeah. I, normally, it's like, he, you know, one party claims he was made. That would be impossible. Or that Spalaccio had a maid. doesn't work that way. You would have to go in front of the hierarchy of the family, and they're the only ones that are going to do it. No one, they don't give that right to anybody else. The Bob doesn't work that way. So, I mean, you know, people take liberties with what really happened. You know, that's why I always try to point out what I don't know, I don't know. You know, right. always, so you don't, no one knows everything. Uh, 
and, and you know, or, you know, as much as I know a lot of people, and uh, and that, but that does, you know, to me, like I said, I don't like being called an expert because I don't consider myself one. There's no such thing. And if, if some of these people in the witness protection program stop saying they can't get into matters, they they should stop because because that means they're either involved in something new. Or uh, why else would you do it? Or that they didn't know. So I mean, people got a tendency to exaggerate their self worth. That's um, one of the things I've seen a lot of. Now I don't knock anybody. I'll never knock anybody for doing that uh, because they're making, they're, they're writing books, or they're trying to make money. That I could understand that. A lot of times, you know, these reporters and some of these reporters get the stories wrong in the first place. A, a prime example was Joe Griffin. Joe Griffin was an FBI agent uh, working. He, he, he went to head up Cleveland, but before he did that, he was in Buffalo as a, a, a special agent. And Joe and I sat down a lot, a lot of time about that. You know what's going on? I says, Joe, you have your book wrong. Sammy Perry was never the boss. He was never the boss. Before my father was the old man and his kid Peter. You know, Pete. Like I said, we were quite close. And uh, after that, it was Sammy Frenchmore. Sammy, I ran with Sammy Perry. I would know uh, <laughs> if he was paid or not. But Joe ran yeah. with it anyway because some witness, that some valued witness said that. A lot of times these witnesses don't know. Right. They don't know. You know, it's like, was, was Leonard ever the boss? Let, if Leonard fell in Western New York, was he ever the boss? No. Was he put up there to be a fall guy for, for Joe Tenal Jr.? Yes. That's what happened. They'll do that. That's like with Salerno. You don't know Jim Giganti or who else is behind the scenes. It's, it's a myriad of different groups, uh, uh, the Genovese family. Uh, Sarah, uh, you know, I had a lot of dealings with them. And, and laundering money, I had a lot of different dealings with them. Uh, and I was going to say, you, you did have a close call, too, with... Is that with the, No, with, uh, <laughs> with the homeless guy coming in. You know, oh, and yeah, job. That, was, that was, yeah, that was something I sure did. It was a oh. homeless guy that comes into my office and he tells me, when, when you see what I have, you're going to get me a job or words to that effect. I said, what do you have? He says, I got all the, the documents from the FBI regarding everybody in local 210. I said, you do it. He explained that the FBI agents were parked across the street. They seen someone get out of local 210 and they started following following him on foot he went in the car took the agent's briefcase and weapon so i, I told him here here's what you do i says my car is the following in the parking lot i want you to put that stuff by my car under the tire and uh, you come back on monday so it must have been a friday or something i says you come back on monday or thursday and i'll have a job for you now i got my i got a problem because no sooner is the, 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 I didn't get a chance to put the documents he left on my table. He, the, the rest under the tire, okay, he was taking care. But there were a lot of documents he was showing me that were that was on my uh, my desk. So Joe Tenaro walks in. What's this? I tell him, this is what happened. You know, guy, he says, so he's figuring, figuring through those with a paper clip. He doesn't want to leave his fingerprints on them. Leonard Fell's own comes downstairs. He was at that step at that time. He was the business or the, the, the head of the benefit funds uh, administrator. He comes downstairs. He says, Hey, these are great. My lawyer can use this. He grabs. Now I got to contact. I, I got to contact the bureau to let him know what happened. I get on the phone. I first of all, try for Alphonse Hartle. I says, you know, get a hold of Al because Al was working out of the Department of Labor at that time. He was part of the strike force, but he was working on a DOL. Well. I, I knew the secretary. I can't think of her name. I says, get Al on the phone. I'm coming over there now. I go over there. And uh, Jack Porstel from the bureau comes up, uh, upstairs or downstairs to meet me. And we're in there, and I knew Jack. I says, Jack, this is what's going on. Now, I'm going to have a problem. I got all these tires, all this, this documentation that I get you know, that uh, I have outside in the back car. I got to give it so get rid of it. But then I got to answer if this bum member comes back. He says he took a briefcase with a weapon too. I have my problems. You know, sooner or later, I'm going to have a problem. He says, we'll take care of it. Now, this was in the morning. 
I then go on to see the union attorney and explain to him. And I didn't tell him about the briefcase, only the documents that one of Phil's own took. Uh, and he says, well, no, that's that's a government property. You can't do that. you got to give it back. Uh, they're going to send an attorney over there. Now, I still got a problem. So I uh, finally, Don Hartnett, who was the supervisor uh, for organized crime in Western New York for the FBI, I uh, told him, Donnie, you got to meet me. You got to meet me now because I'm going to have my hands full with this. Uh, so I'm backing down an alley to go meet. I almost hit the poor guy. His coffee went spilling all over the place. <laughs> I told him, here's what you got to do. You got to get this bum. This bum comes back to the union hall on Monday, broke up for a job. I got a problem. And then I explained, Leonard Felzone's got the documents. The, the other ones, besides what I just gave Jack Porston, they arranged that they're going to go into the union, see what they're going to grab the ones from uh, Leonard, but they're also going to pick up the bum. Now, we're concerned about how do they know the documents are in Leonard's office? How do, you, how do we know outside of my word that they went upstairs? And so we had to show that the union was bugged and the bureau can't do that. I went in a ring, so I went to a, a folk radio shack or something, picked up a, a, a microphone and I put it up in the ceiling. And well, ironically, when we, when we, did it, we had a company come in from Horseheads, New York to do a sweep. They found that, and they said, nah, this could never have been it. They're not going to use the bureau doesn't use items like this. But we did find a problem that the ventilation on the building, everything would talk, go through the ventilation. You could very easily pick it up from the street with a bigger. So that was uh, the saving grace on that. And they, by the way, the bomb never did come back. But I didn't <laughs> like when the bureau went in. Instead of going, you know, they went, put the facade on, went through my office, started going through the offices down. But no sooner than, you know, that was two or three, eight agents went upstairs to Leonard's office. Why don't you tell them where it's at? So that's where, thank God, I was able that they were bugging themselves, you know. But uh, got through with that one. Another big time, I got caught. I got caught with Jack Porstel in the car. Uh, we're going, and we're driving. We were stupid in those days. We're driving in the car. I'm in the, the front seat next to Jack Porstel. We're discussing things. He was the FBI agent. And who do we see across the street? Nicky Rodaldo, Billy Shalino, and who are we else was in the car? Well, no, I know I'm in trouble. I get caught with the FBI. And no sort of that happened. They uh, leaked it to uh, Sammy Frenchmore. Sammy Frenchmore wants to see me. So I go to his house. I went had to go all the way out to Angola, which is quite a ride. I go to his house. I says, Sammy, here's what happened. I'm start standing in front of the union. And these, these bureau agents came over. I didn't know they were agents until they told me, get in the car. I thought I was under arrest. I get in the car, and they started talking, Ronnie, you're a good kid. You know, you, you, this life is not for you. We could really use your help. And I said, I'm not gonna, you know, I can't discuss anything without my attorney being present. And they kept driving me around, prodding me to, to cooperate, and I wouldn't do it. That's the story I told to Sammy Frenchmore. Obviously, he believed it because nothing happened to me. <laughs> no, I mean, yeah, if he didn't, I mean, you would have been gone just like that. Yeah, I mean, oh, yeah, you know, yeah. play around like that. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. when did you have to go and testify on anybody, like when this case wrapped up with, I mean, because how, how long was this? I never case? testified in Buffalo outside of a couple small little cases. I never did that. The reason for that, the U.S. attorney back in Buffalo did not like the FBI and did that like me, and I didn't like him. <laughs> you know, so I mean, then we, he once told me we're sitting there with Rob, Rob Langford, who was the special agent in charge of the Buffalo office, said, Ron, we're going to meet this guy, that is Michael. And uh, what we want you to do is be good, please. Don't tear him apart. Don't tear him apart. This has got to stop because we need this. We're not going to make any cases. And Rob was a good man. I says, okay, Rob. No sooner we get to this holiday end, that is Michael comes in with that arrogant attitude. And uh, I says, you know, Dennis, you're a crook because I know how you got your job. I know who was behind it. And uh, I mean, it's just the, the whole meeting exploded. And uh, he says, you'll never work in Buffalo. I says, Dennis, you can't fire me. I don't work in, in Buffalo. Because at that time, I think I was being taken care of out of headquarters or, or Chicago. I forget. But anyway, uh, couldn't stand that man. I know how he got his job, and it was the mob behind it. With other big business, he turned his back on the Love Canal. I know about all the cheating. We had a major case going on up there, uh, illegal dumping. 
We had one there in Kansas City, Rose Chemical, with the same party. So they were just yeah. dumping toxic waste in the oh, water. Yeah. Yeah, they're getting away with it. I mean, there's a lot of politicians involved, corruption. And, you know, I wanted the bureau to, to do something, and they agreed with me until it came, push came to shove at that time. So I go and see uh, Gene Methvin. Gene Methvin was senior editor of Reader's Digest and one of my mentors. And I told him, Gene, this is what's going on here. And this is all caused because of Al D'Amato, who was a senator at that time from New York, pushing these people. Uh, you know, and I knew about all the, the corruption. He says, well, he'll t look into it. He got back to me and says, he, after meeting Meese, uh, you know, because he was actually had, was a very prominent during the Reagan administration. He says, Ron, they're going to do something they can't right now. You can't step out of a, a senator right now. But I says, listen, I can't make these cases. Well, don't worry. We'll, we'll backdoor it after we do the Labor's International. They started working to try to work around where I would avoid this this vodka with this corruption. So that ended it for me in, in Buffalo. I mean, we had witnesses galore, informants ready to come forth. We had this Johnny Sacco that knew everything. But Dennis mm -hmm. Sacco was, was, uh, blamed the FBI putting these irresponsible witnesses on the stand. You know, it, it, it was a terrible situation. You run that into that. Yeah, that was politics. I mean, it, it goes both ways. I don't care if it's Democrat or Republican. Too much politics can rear their ugly head and to trying to help the people themselves. And I don't like that. I mean, if I'm good, I mean, you know, uh, if I'm going to do something, I'm always going to err on the side of the people, or at least try to. That's the way I am. I mean, that's the way, you know, I don't want to take somebody else's money. I mean, it's people work for that and they're getting robbed and I'm supposed to take their money that they have very little of or their pension funds. How do I live with myself? You can't do it. So. So that's why I'm still fighting as much as I can. It's that simple. It's not that simple. You know, it's hard to make a case. you got to overwhelm it. You just can't go in. Even then you may not make it. You know, you can very easily get a tainted jury. Much simpler than people realize. They may not show it, but it happens. Yeah. No, well, I'm glad they got, you know, in this world, we got people like you that well, are standing yeah. up for the, the little guy, you know what I mean? And the one that doesn't try and defend themselves, man, because if we yeah. don't, you know, there'd be so much more corruption going on. But we well, got people like you. <laughs> it's tough enough. But, it's tough, you know, I thank you for that. I'm not big on myself. I screwed up too much of my life. So I don't have that. The only ego I have is over the size of my stomach. I have to get back in shape a little bit. That's the only <laughs> ego problem I have. But, uh, going bald does not bother me, you know, aging. Yeah. Going on shaving with my gray hair showing through. <laughs> <laughs> Where uh, can the people find your book, Ron? Oh, it's on Amazon. It's, it's all over the place. You know, they have it at Barnes & Noble. They can order it. You know, I don't even have a copy of the... It's called Mr. Undercover, but they... they I try to be honest in it. You know, I talk about my own warts, but it was, you know, mistakes I've made. I'd rather do that. That shows you, you know, to, because we all make mistakes. No one's just a you know, pristine person. That's right. like, you know, a lot of these informants, well, you know, here, you know, I, I've seen the light. They didn't see the light. They seen a jail sentence. And then maybe they'd seen the light. You know? <laughs> not that it gets that it's necessary. I mean, some I, I, I like. I like Frankie Calabrese, Andy Donato. I mean, these are friends of mine, a lot of them. I mean, I like Frank Pilata. He's a character. Tony Montana. Now, Tony Montana, his family came from Buffalo. And, you know, and I knew John Montana and all the Kettens, uh, Ken Rosos and everybody that ran with that family. But him I don't remember. I understand that he went to Chicago as a bartender. I mean, that's the story I've heard, but I didn't know him from the mob. You know, yeah. there was a, there was a, quite a few of them I knew. In fact, I I, I told Frank Pilata one time. He says he's going to be talking to Pudgy Batessa from from Chicago. Pudgy's a big guy, and I, I says tell Pudgy I said hello. He got back to me. Pudgy said to go fuck yourself. That <laughs> 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 cost him his job. You know, he was with the Labor's International, but that was a scam too. They, 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 yeah. No, well, that's funny. I mean, well, at least you still got, you know, your connections with everyone. And, you know, yeah. even with the, the mob guys, you know, that are, you know, seeing the light, you know what I mean? And truly mean it. I mean, yeah, it, that's different. Yeah. You know, I'm, like, I'm be willing to help anybody. I mean, one of the problems I had in the Riggy case is I call him a quiet, humble guy. He was. 
Johnny <laughs> Riggie was always quiet and humble. We would talk at the Holiday Inn where his daughter worked. Uh, the Johnny Riggie, you know, was a friend. But putting him in jail, you know, do I like doing that? No, of course not. But I have no choice because of what he's doing to the laborers. You know, I have to think above my friendship and think about those work, the, you know, the workers. I mean, that's, I don't know if it's ingrained in me or, or something happened in my life that I felt that way. But I never, you know, I was no, you know, I always want, I didn't want to ride first class. One of the things they required. I didn't want to stay in the ambassador suite at the Hyatt Hotel in Honolulu where they put me up. Uh, you know, I don't like that, you know, because this is, this money's coming from where? It's coming from the working class. You know, right. because, and yes, I have to travel, but I'll, I'll travel on the back of the plane. You know, I don't yeah. have to, you know, I'm not going to uh, spend all this excess money for hotels. I mean, one agent would take his whole family down to Disney World, then bring his whole family, cousins and nephews to Las Brisas in Mexico, and it's being paid by the, the union's pension fund. Now, how do you Damn. do that? How do you, do, how do you look somebody in the eye and say, you know, gee, thank you for paying for my trip? You yeah. know, my my my, uh, my comfort. You don't do that. You do. Yeah, I'm mean, sorry. Right. Yeah, you know, I'd rather you know, you know, when I die, I want to die with dignity of being trying to do the right thing. I do that now. I mean, I work as a private detective. I have one case. I get a call from a black mother about a year ago. My son is innocent. He's been in jail for 16 years, and he was sentenced to life plus 28 for a crime he didn't commit. Now they have no money, you know. Now they they, they can't pay. So uh, this is I'll look into it. I look into it, find the guy's innocent. Huh. The very uh, the very witnesses that testified against them are telling me a different story that they lied, and I have my mm -hmm. audio tape. Now getting the attorney getting an attorney to work, no attorney's going to be like me and do it for free. Uh, they want their money. Well, where are we going to get the money? I don't have the money. The client, these people don't have the money. That's uh, no one has the money, you know. So finally, uh, I, you know, using my connections, I get the Innocence Project involved. So they're picking mm. up. They, I got a call from William and Mary College that they're, they're picked up. They picked up the case. So, That's I mean, good. The proof, the, the proof is there. They'll get out. I mean, it's, he's been a criminal all his life, but not what he was charged with. That's the problem. I mean, if I could help straighten this guy out, put him back on the straight and narrow, then I've accomplished something. You know, I'll help him have this to get a job, get him off the streets. Too many kids in the, I mean, this violence, I mean, this is out of control. I've never seen any, the hatred like you see today. What mm -hmm. is wrong with people? I mean, every, they care about themselves or I need my comfort zone, comfort zone. I like to have a comfort zone too. I've been living my life on the edge. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but... Uh, uh, I mean, it's that's life. You have yeah. to work. Another, no one wants to work anymore. I know. Well, I do uh, appreciate you coming on, Ron, and oh, you know, you. I'll I'll uh, be sure to put your your book's link in the video description if anybody wants to check it out because he goes into way, way, way more depth of yeah, everything that he back. went through. You know. Yeah, so, I can always come back in the future as well. So. Yeah. Well, thank you for coming on. Uh, I appreciate. Do do well with your 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 show here. Invest in yourself podcast, huh? Ron has a very unique, different story. He helped take down lots of bad guys while working with the FBI. He is now retired and telling his life story. Lots of people involved with crime can really learn from his story. It's never too late to make a change in your life. Please comment any key takeaways that you got from this interview. Please share this video with anyone that you think will enjoy this type of content. Also, please don't forget to hit subscribe to my YouTube channel if you want to get more interviews like this. Ron's book will be in the video description as well. And thank you all for watching. We'll see you on the next one.